<laughs> all right, guys, good morning to all of you. It is good to see you here this morning. It's good to be home for me in general. I've been in and out for so many weeks now, but we, we are officially here uh, for a while now, and it's just good to be back with all of you on a regular basis. I uh, Thursday went to uh, a camp up in Oklahoma, spent the day there, was talking to some people, and, and one of the teens was talking to me. He's actually in college now, and he said, I've noticed something over this past year, my first year at Oklahoma Christian, that I feel like in different moments of my life, God is teaching me different things. And I said, well, yeah. I said, that's, that's kind of how God works. And, and he went on to, to tell me what he feels like he has been learning over this past several months. What he feels like God has been telling him and teaching him and just went through it all. And then finally he looks at me and he goes, so what season are you in right now? I was like, oh, there's the question. And so I, I started thinking about it, and I just started thinking about how, how God works and how God really worked through this summer. As a lot of y'all know, we went to several different camps, and, and I, I had a hand in all of them. I didn't have a hand in some. We just went, and we were participants, but I really didn't play an active role in saying, this is our theme. This is what we're going to do, and there's no other thing we're going to cover. So God just kind of took a lot of different people in my life and really laid out a, a very well-thought-out message. We started our summer by going to Chioka, and the theme there essentially was stronghold. In that, uh, if you look in 2 Corinthians uh, 10 verses 3 through 5, it talks about how God destroys strongholds. Those strongholds in your, in your life, those things that are holding you back, those things that got a hold of you, God can destroy those. And throughout the rest of the Bible, stronghold is a very positive thing. Stronghold is something that we find ourselves in refuge, we find ourselves surrounded, we find ourselves in safety. And so as we were planning it, we were sitting there going, how do we put a negative word on the shirt and then turn around and tell them, just kidding, it's really positive. We did it. We found a way. We started talking about fears and how fears build up those false strongholds. But God comes in and creates new ones. Huh. Well, then we went off to work camp. The theme was renewal. God renews us. Oh. So we had that, that old stronghold, and now we have a new one. A better one. I was like, all right. <laughs> all right, God, I'm, I'm picking up with you. I'm hearing it. And then we got ready. We came through VBS, and it was great. We, we saw the ultimate superhero, and we saw who Jesus is and who Jesus was and what he does with us today. And it was amazing. We see how he makes us new, that he is the one that come in, and he kicks down those strongholds. I was like, wow, this is, this is awesome. This is amazing. And so the different teens that followed that journey with me which I think there was one that went to everything. Tori, that was you, girl. So you're trucking with me here. You were there with me. You, you heard all these same messages. And then we went to Camp Quanania, where we heard about control. How we should give up control. How we, we strive so hard to be in control of everything around us and have everything planned out and everything detailed and everything going the way that we want it. And there's a God that has such a greater plan. And so when he's asking me this question, he, he asked, what, what are you learning right now? I said, I'm learning that I'm weak and I'm learning that it's not my battle. If I just submit, if I just give it over to him, he's got it. He is the king of all. He is the truth that battles my fears. He is the one that leads my life. And I don't have to just be so fretting and worrying about it because I am his. And it's a beautiful thing. So today I just want to share a little bit of piece of that with y'all. I just want to share a little bit of kind of what I've been learning so you can learn with me, so we can walk this together. I want y'all to think about when you're sick. I know it's not the most positive thing to think about, but think about those moments you're not feeling well. Maybe you got like a runny nose, your ears hurting, you got a tummy ache. Like there's tons of different options. You think of yours. 
And if you go into the doctor and you tell him what's wrong, or you tell her what's, what's hurting, and they're just like, oh, you know, you got a runny nose? Well, here's a tissue. Just blow it and go on. Uh, no, no, thank you. I came, I came to find out a little bit more than just take a tissue and go on. Your stomach's hurting a little bit, and they just look at you and pat you on the back. Well, it'll pass. It'll pass. It'll be okay. And you're sitting there, and you're thinking, you're the doctor. You're supposed to be helping me. You're supposed to be treating me. You're supposed to be helping me get through this uncomfortable stage I'm in. We do this sometimes in our Christianity. One thing I learned this summer was I am guilty of not teaching the way I should. I grew up in a church that taught me this way. I started teaching this way once I was out of college. And we do a lot in the church about focusing on our symptoms. We do a lot about focusing on those things in our life that people can see that are very prevalent, that people notice, the runny nose, the gooky eye, maybe the upset stomach. But we don't oftentimes really get down to, where does that stuff come from? Where is that stuff coming into play in our lives? If you will, turn to Ephesians 4 with me. This is one of my favorite sections of Scripture. Because Paul puts a lot of negative kind of in a positive he puts a lot of things where he's, he's going to list out some symptoms and he's going to tell the church, you know, straighten these things up. Correct yourselves. And we should. I'm one to say, I don't want to walk around with a runny nose. I don't want you to have to walk around looking at my runny nose. I want to clean that up. But if I don't figure out the source of the cold, if I don't go in and start treating the virus or treating whatever has really caused that runny nose... I'm just going to keep blowing it, and it's going to keep coming back. Ephesians 4, starting with verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and you were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in the true righteousness and holiness." So he starts off by saying, you're not these Gentiles. You're not these people that come in here and they do these things. You are new. You're not old. You're new. You're not that thing that you used to be. You're something different. You're something beautiful. Amen, right? It's awesome. So then he goes on to say in verse 25, Therefore, putting away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. I want you to look through that passage I just read, and if you're somebody that kind of, if you write in your Bible, uh, you can do this. If you're taking notes, jot down what is you in that situation. 
What are some places in that that are symptoms in your life? What are some things going on right now? Maybe there's some anger. Maybe there's some slander. Maybe there's some malice. Maybe you're just negative. You're in a bad mood. Whatever it is, maybe put a dot next to those places so you can go back and you can specifically be praying over these things. But I want to ask you this. Why? Why are you angry? Why are you negative? Why are you not encouraging? Why is it you find yourself in places that you never wanted to be? Why is it that you you have these situations? I just lost my Bible. There it is. Why is it you find yourself in these in these situations where there's the corrupting talk? Why is it that we are stealing? Why is it we're taking the easy way? See, I told you on the beginning that these sins are symptoms. And if you really think about it, if you really start processing your life, you didn't just out of nowhere decide, I'm going to start doing this sin. We're good people. We're God-fearing people. We're God-loving people. We're not just going to go out and, and commit some random sin. So what happened? What got us to this point? If you read through chapter 5 through verse 21, I believe that all is just one big section of telling us what to avoid and how to live, how to treat one another and how to love. And it's a good place for us to start just to say, this is a healthy person, where am I? If these are my symptoms, what is the cause? And that's what I want us to, to at least start thinking about today. I am not... I am not a healthy person. I am not a healthy Christian. There are still things that I battle daily. And I love that I'm learning this summer that I just need to give it over. I love that I'm learning this summer that I need to search for truth to battle what it is that has made me think I'm not good enough. That has made me think i got to work harder. That has made me think that grace is not enough for me. but I had to dig deep and I had to figure out where those lies came from. We're going to go to the Old Testament. If you will turn to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Now this is a decently known story, but not necessarily super common. Um, I know when we were reading through it for camp, I was sitting there kind of thinking about, I, I, I cannot remember the last time I heard the story of David and Abigail and her husband Nabal. I can't remember the last time that I sat in a class or I sat in an auditorium where somebody was coming in and talking about Abigail and Nabal and how David fits in. It's just, it's not one you hear too often. So we were looking at it and we were going through it. And I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you, I promise. But I do want you to read it. I do want you to go home and read the story for its entirety. I want you to see that David comes in and he's protecting Nabal's men in the wilderness. He's protecting them. No harm comes to them. And so David requests, Nabal, can can I get some food? Can I just get some food? A little bit of, of just hospitality for what we've done for you out in the wilderness. A book I was reading on this topic and this story was talking about, he was basically, basically asking for the equivalent of a hamburger. Man, can I just get a hamburger from you? Because we, we've been working hard to protect you and we're hungry. We just need a little bit back. And Nabal, if you've read the story or if you haven't and you read through it, you'll see he's kind of a crude man. He's, he's very um, possessive of his things. He loves his party. He loves his splendor. And he loves all that he gets to go and do. And he, he tells his men to go back and ask David, who is this David that comes asking me for this? Why should I, why should I cater to him? Who are you? Now, granted, I think a lot of us, if some random person showed up at our door and said, you know, David Smith would like to come and have a hamburger with you, you would have some questions. I don't think there's many of us in here that would really go, oh, yeah, sure, come on over. I love having random strangers into my home, and thank you so much for the kind act you've already done for me. 
We're going to ask questions. We're going to wonder who this person is. Whether it was right or wrong for Nabal to do so, we can kind of see where it's a common practice. Who is this person? Because if you notice, Saul's still king. David's been anointed, but he's not just a huge man on the totem pole yet. David reacts when he hears this message with anger. Not just anger, not just who are you to question me, but he then says, grab your swords. We will not leave one living male in the house of Nabal. We are going to go and kill them all. I don't know about you, but that's not how I would react. I'm not going to go and kill everybody just because they turned me down for a meal. But David is angry. David is furious. David is sitting here and he's just fuming out of his head of why would he question who I am? So where does that come from? Look back with me at 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want y'all to look at it. Starting with with verse 1, this is more of a common story for us. I think we've all heard about how David is selected and anointed as king. Samuel goes to the house of Jesse, and he goes up to son number 1. Nope, not you. Goes up to son number 2. Nope, not you. Makes his way through all the sons that Samuel had gathered there, correct? And Samuel finally goes, man, like God sent me here. I, I don't get it. If, if God sent me here, why am I not finding this king that I know I'm coming to anoint? So Samuel finally asks the question, do you have another son that's not here? And Jesse's like, well, I, I got the youngest. He's a little shepherd boy out in the field. Oh, bring him in. And lo and behold, who is named king? David. But I want you to think about something. You are David, young. And one of the most important people in the nation comes to your house. And your dad calls all of your siblings in, except for you. You got to stay where you are. Granted, somebody had to stay with the sheep. Okay. But he was still brought in, so could he have just brought the sheep in just to meet with Samuel? Get to see this guy? Get to experience time with him? I'm going to be open and honest. This is not written in Scripture. But you got to think about, how is David feeling? you got to think about the fact that he was left out of meeting one of the most important people in the nation. I wonder what Jesse's view of David was. He's got all these other sons, and they're going to run the farm. And David, you know, Jesse's old, and David's young. And he's just, son, just get out there and watch the sheep. I'm tired. I wonder what his view of David was. And more importantly, whether Jesse had a good view of David or not, I wonder what David read into when his father didn't even bring him in. Now, again... It's not in scripture. It's not there to tell us how David felt. But if you're anything like me, somebody has said something to you before that has changed your mindset on something. Somebody has said something to you that made you feel a little less than you did the moment before it was said. And then your actions start reflecting that. As I shared with the kids at camp, I, and and, and y'all have met my family. I have a great relationship with my family. I love my family. We are so much better than we ever used to be. But there was a time period that it was just a rocky world, the world we lived in. And there was a time period that I am outside with my dad helping him with something, and I'm, I'm not getting it right. Some sort of we're building something, and I'm not, I'm not the most, you know, mechanically inclined human. My dad is. He's been a maintenance man for 100 years, it feels like. And he looks at me in this moment that I'm not getting it. I'm, I'm frustrated and just says to me, 
why can't you be like so-and-so, named a specific name, because he knows what he's doing when it comes to tools. I wish I had a son like that. Huh. Okay. Not a good moment. I'm already frustrated that I can't do it. I'm being told I can't do it. And then I'm just being told I'm not good enough for the position I hold. He didn't mean to crush my spirits. He didn't mean to set into motion a mindset of I can't achieve, I can't succeed, I'm not good enough, I'm not qualified. He didn't mean to start that ripple effect, but it happened. I'm not saying Jesse meant to do anything. I'm not saying Jesse did do anything. David may have been like, I love tending the sheep. Y'all have a party, I'll sit here with them. But what in David's life set forth a motion of him to get so angry when somebody just says, who are you? Why are you wanting, why are you doing this? And why are you wanting something from me? If I had to guess, every single one of us in here have had a moment like that. Or somebody has doubted you. Somebody has, has done something. Maybe it's... Um, one of, the, one of the other adults out there, her, her big thing was she didn't feel loved. Not because anybody had really said anything, but because she never, other than her, her family, her mom and dad, no, no guy had really loved her. She felt like it was never going to happen. And because of that, Satan had created a wall and a wedge and it started coming in and building something up. And when Satan builds up a wall and a wedge, that is separation. And separation is when sin occurs because sin is what separates us. So I'll go back to say, the sin is not the problem in your life, everybody. Sin is the symptom. Sin is the symptom. You can willpower yourself to stop doing whatever it is you're struggling with for a little while. A couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. But until we deal with the hurt in our life, until we acknowledge what it is and we give it over to Christ, we will never, we will never escape sin until we give it to him. If you look back at 1 Samuel 25, the story ends with Abigail hearing of what David is about to come and do. And so she gathers up some food, she gathers up some supplies, and she makes a beeline to David. And she essentially falls at his feet and just starts telling him that she knows, that she understands. And she even warns him, she says, if you do this, this is, this is a revenge but your God, your God is greater than that. And you are selected by God. What she does is she reminds him of who he is. She reminds him of some truth. Yes, my husband's a fool. And yes, he questioned you. And that, that is him. But please, on behalf of our whole household, let my words bring truth to you. And David doesn't. What's funny is God does. Abigail goes back home, tells Nabal all that was to occur, and at her words, he falls over dead. And then David honors a promise to Abigail that he would protect her. And now that she is widowed, he goes, and he claims her as his bride. I hope you have an Abigail in your life. Someone who is willing to speak God's truth into you. Someone who is willing to remind you that you're not what the world said. You're not what Satan has convinced you you are. That those fears that are holding you back, they're nothing. Those lies are just Satan's weapons. They're not true. 
by nature, a lie is not true. I hope that you can hear the words that people are speaking into you. I hope that you believe that this isn't just some sort of jargon, that this isn't just something that I feel like I have to do to serve God. It's something that I want to do. It's something that I want to tell you. I want to tell every single one of you in here that you are loved, that you are enough. The way you're created, the way that you're different, the way that you stand out in a crowd is exactly what God needed from you to do his will. So going back to what I learned this summer, just submit. Just give up control. Stop holding on to those fears that are building those wrong strongholds. Stop holding on to those lies and give it over. Let it go. And I know this 30-minute sermon isn't going to be enough to, to bring all these things out and to bring all these things up for you. Talk to somebody. Talk to a, a, a family member. Talk to a friend. Talk to the elders. Talk to Michael. Talk to me. Talk to anybody that you trust that has a, a godly perspective that is going to speak truth into you. So you can give it up. And here's why. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians chapter five. Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no more. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. How cool is it is that is who you are? See, the world may see our flesh. And there be moments where we're weak. We may see each other's flesh. But God does not. God sees what he created. God sees so much more. A couple of things I want to challenge us with. And, and I think I say this to y'all every time I preach. I know I say it to the kids at least once a month, but there's, there's three things God wants from us. Three things that give us a purpose. It's a reason we're not a dog or an elephant or a giraffe. We have purpose in life to serve him. And the first one is we are to seek the lost. There are so many people out in the world that don't know this love, that don't know that they aren't their past, that they don't know that they aren't their, their maybe current sin, that they are more than what they do. We are those ambassadors because we are new creations. Second thing, and it's why we're here this morning. We have to walk with one another. We have to help one another. If Nell needs to hear a truth, I need to be there to give it to her. If, if Roger needs to hear a truth, I need to be there to give it to him. If, if somebody is weak, we prop them up because we are the ambassadors for Christ here on this earth. We got to walk with one another. We got to help one another get closer. And the third thing is we got to glorify God in all that we do. Not just Sundays, not just Wednesdays, not just at night when we pray, not just when we open our Bibles, but every little moment, we got to find ourselves glorifying God. And what that does is it takes me to what I heard a few nights ago in Oklahoma. I was there for one night, and the lesson was fix your focus on what's above. 
we got to, we got to redirect our eyes. I don't know about y'all, but I know for me, I can get caught up in the world. I can get caught up in what's next. I can get caught up in, in what the world thinks matters. And I get lost on what I should be doing. And more of those lies and more of those fears creep in. And I slowly am taking control back from God. I hope you hear me today when I say you're not your past and you're not your present. Because in the next moment, you can choose to follow him. You can choose to surrender. You can choose to accept the fact you are new. You're not what you used to be. You're not who you used to be. So for those of you, maybe you haven't given yourself over to Christ. Maybe you haven't said, you are Lord of my life. I am no longer. I'm cutting off my flesh and putting you on. That can be today. That can be today if you understand, I am no longer, I am new. And for those of you that maybe a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, or 40 years ago, you put on Christ, but you feel like you're kind of straight away that you haven't been surrendering to him, giving it over to him, acknowledging his truth, it can start in this moment. You're not your mistakes. You're not your past. And you have a beautiful future to look to, whether it be here or in eternity and glory. But you do have to decide today. And then you have to decide an hour from now. And then you have to decide tomorrow. And then really just every moment, you kind of just got to go, nope, still yours. Nope, I'm still yours. But let's start today.